Lord God, we come to you in prayer now, just giving you the sacrifices of our hearts and our minds. Lord, we long to draw near to you, and we just pray that through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we can do that now as we commune with him. We pray for the spiritual food that you're about to feed us in your word. And we pray for an unquenchable thirst and hunger for your word. So today we just want to come straight to the well and draw the water of life today. And I just pray life into Marcus Vaughn today, God. I pray that you lift him up in his physical condition and you comfort him. And bring him your peace which surpasses all understanding and just let Jesus be with him now. And Lord, I pray your will in his life, but with the authority of Christ, it's by his stripes we're healed. And I proclaim 100% healing for Marcus, if that be your will. And I pray for everybody else that um, is physically going through a situation. I want to pray for Christine's aunt. And everybody else that's in need, God, I'll just let my spirit um, utter and groan on behalf of my heart and mind that has a lot of people on it, both of them. We just lift all of our cares and concerns up to you, Lord God, and we put our trust and confidence in you, and we know that your will will be done. And it's in faith that we proclaim all these things through the shed blood of Christ and the authority that's vested in us through His righteousness. Amen. Today's verse of the day comes from Psalms chapter 90, and it's verses 2 and 4. It's only... It's, uh, to me, it was really weird, so... It's a great verse combo, but after having structured what we're going to take a walk through in some devotionals... I felt it more um, prudent to just read the whole chapter of Psalm 90. And you'll see why we have the background picture that we do, uh, which is pretty cool. So today is uh, Friday, June 7th, 2019. So the Bible Gateway verse of the day uh, for this very day comes from Psalms chapter 90. And it's really interesting. I misspoke. I mean, it was quite a long while ago now, and I doubt anyone ever honestly probably remembers what I said precisely. But um, I was kind of disappointed and a little surprised at how little prayer there was in the scriptures. Um, and that when the disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray? I think I said something along the lines of praying wasn't the thing to do, you know, so they, they needed to get instruction and guidance. Um, I was wrong. There is quite a bit of prayer all throughout the scriptures, and I don't know how much people applied the scriptures in their lives in Israel back in those times. We do have always people that were loyal to God, no matter what the circumstances and conditions were of Israel. And, but oftentimes Israel would have a... Um, a period where they would backslide and turn away from God. It's always this ebb and flow of drawing near to Him and then walking away. Drawing near and walking away. So, it was mostly probably um, not enough attention being paid on my part. And since I had misstated that, because there's some truth to that, but I think I over... Mm, I don't know what the I wasn't exaggerating, but I think I I think I just missed the mark, you know, and generalized. That's probably what I'm looking for. Over generalized. Now, this is from Psalm ninety, and this is, you know, probably David arranging this, but it's a prayer of Moses, the man of God. And we know a lot of the Psalms are prayers, but in the Old Testament there's quite a number of prayers that are very direct and specific and as I was talking uh, the last few weeks about praying just straight scripture as a prayer, you find in scripture that a lot of direct scripture is nothing but a prayer. So it's really cool. <laughs> and so here we are, Psalm chapter 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God, right? And 
Yeah, I'm going to leave the picture up. I was going to go through the text uh, so you could read along, but hey, if y'all are old school like me and have your Bibles handy, why don't you open up to Psalm chapter 90 and read along. It says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, or you are God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. Now the verse of the day left that out, and this, is, this verse 3 is going to be something of a theme today. So it says, You turn man to destruction, and say, Return, you children of men. For a thousand years in the sight, in your sight, thy sight, are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood, they are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up, in the morning it flourish, it flourisheth or flourishes and groweth up, in the evening it is cut down and withereth, or withers. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. Now a score is twenty, so threescore would be sixty. And then ten would be seventy. So seventy years is what they're saying if you want to do the math. It says the days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years or eighty years old. Yet it is the strength, labor, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let your work appear unto your servants, and your glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish you the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish you it. Whew. Man, it's very powerful. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I just noticed something very interesting. Um, so the verse of the day, what it, what it says on Bible Gateway is, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. So, excuse me. So it said all that, but it left out verse 3 in the middle. You turn man to destruction and say, return you children of men. Oh, the first thing I wanted to start with today was um, a, a new devotional from Mr. Spurgeon that's different than the morning and evening. This is Spurgeon at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and it's 365 sermons. And this is for Friday, June 7th, 2019. So, now it's not specific only to young men. You could just say younger people in general. And it's not completely 100% like the principles of what he's going to portray here. Like some of the value that you can ascertain from it doesn't necessarily... Um, it's not real reflective of age. So if you're an older person, um, don't lose what what is in here for you. If you're an older woman, don't lose what's in here for you. And don't just understand it as only being for young men. But Mr. Spurgeon did call this the young man's prayer. And it uh, really spoke to my heart. So it says, now check this out. I didn't do this, and this is exactly what I just thought that I saw. 
and I wanted to wait and not say anything to make sure. Can you guys see this? Are y'all paying any attention? Can you guys see what psalm this is from? And this, this is a, uh, this is from June seventh, eighteen sixty-three. Okay, sermon number five thirteen. I'm not good at math, but it's two thousand nineteen, eighteen sixty-three. I know eighteen nineteen. Wait, no, I'm not even gonna try to mess this up with my math, but. For this very day, and a new devotional to try out, and it says further reading from Ecclesiastes, but Psalm 90, verse 14, is where he's getting his from. Now, if I hadn't done a little due diligence and checked out the whole of the... Let me see if I can pop it in here real quick. Yeah, so if y'all can see this... There we go. So here's the verse of the day, and it's 90 verses 2 and 4, right? And I was like, oh, what's verse 3 got for us? And I go look at verse 3, and then I'm like, hmm, well, we can't just skip this part. You know, that's the negative thing that they wanted to leave off. So let's give the little positive message, and let's give the positive message, right? But let's leave out this sandwiched in the middle. So come in here to get this to get this verse 3 to come down in, what is it, verse 14? If we hadn't read all the way down to the whole thing, we would have missed this verse right here. And it, that's what caught my eye when I was reading it, because I remembered some of the stuff we're about to go over. But, oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. So when it says, satisfy us early with mercy... I think to myself, like, you wake up early in the morning, seek Him early in the morning, you know, spend some quiet time with God first thing. But it says rejoice and be glad all of our days. So think about from the, this day to your very last, you know, if you're satisfied, if it satisfies God to show you mercy, right? Then if you've received His mercy and grace, then you're saved by that grace through faith. And we have something to be glad all of our days for, right? Now, that's the scripture verse that it's keying in on here. So that was one of those wow moments. We have a lot of those all the time here if we pay attention. And if you if you guys like aren't seeing that as something more than just a coincidence, it coincides with over a hundred years of time differential and it's just, it, to me, these are the fingerprints of God, and it amazes me. But I would not want anyone to be discouraged if they weren't seeing those fingerprints, you know? And if they weren't experiencing the feeling that I have right now, it doesn't mean anything negative. So, it's just, it's a, something positive to point out, and it's to me, it's something that gets me excited. It gets me all fired up. <laughs> Okay, so Mr. Spurgeon says this, O oh, satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Mr. Spurgeon uses that to say this, They who love Jesus Christ early have the best hope of enjoying the happiest days as Christians. They will have the most service, and the service of God is pure delight. Their youthful vigor will enable them to do more than those who enlist when they are old and decrepit. The joy of the Lord is our strength, and on the other hand, to use our strength for God is a fountain of joy. Young man, if you give fifty years of service unto God, surely you shall rejoice all your days. The earlier we are converted, having the longer time to study in Christ's college, the more profound shall be our knowledge of him. I want to read this again, because something I want to point out to you, as I was trying to give a disclaimer earlier, is that just because it says young men's prayer, it's not just for young men, and it doesn't matter if you believed when you were young, or if you just started believing yesterday. It doesn't matter if you were born yesterday, literally. All that matters is what you do with your time and your chance from this point forward. And it's true, better late than never, but the earlier, the mo better, right? So the earlier we are converted, 
having the longer time to study in Christ's college, the more profound shall be our knowledge of him. Now I want to say one last thing before I continue. Even though I was converted early, or I have believed since I was a very young child, there was a long period in my life where I walked away from God's truth in disobedience and absolute rebellion, purposeful rebellion. And of course, like the prodigal son, I came back, and all of those things have been made as power of the word of my testimony and have been used for a greater purpose because I love Christ. So it doesn't mean that just because you get converted early, er, you have the opportunity to spend a longer time studying at Christ College. I dropped out a few times, or I had to drop a few classes. I still haven't got my degree yet, you know, but that's how the college works. In Christ College, you're never done being the student, and this is one case where the student never becomes the master. <laughs> Let's let the teacher teach, and I'll be quiet now and let the preacher preach. <laughs> but the more profound shall be our knowledge of him. We shall have more time for communion more years for fellowship. We shall have more seasons to prove the power of prayer and more opportunities to test the fidelity of God than we should have if we came late. Those who come late are blessed by being helped to learn so much, but those that come in early shall surely outstrip them. Let me be young, like John, that I may have years of loving service and, like him, may have much of intimate acquaintance with my Lord." Surely those who are converted early may reckon upon more joy, because they never will have to contend with and to mourn over what later converts must know. Now this was something that did hit me a little hard. It says, Your bones are not broken. You can run without weariness. You have not fallen as some have done. You can walk without fainting. Often the gray-headed man who is converted at sixty or seventy finds the remembrance of his youthful sins clinging to him. When he would praise, an old lascivious song revives upon his memory. When he would mount up to heaven, he suddenly remembers some scene in a haunt of vice which he would be glad to forget. But you, saved by divine grace before you, thus fall into the jaw of the lion or under the paw of the bear, will certainly have cause for rejoicing all your life. <laughs> wow. It's just so cool how God works. Now this I would say, when you humble yourself to God, um, when you give your sins to Christ, when you truly repent and you, you, know, you have them nailed to the cross and the old you dies and is crucified with Christ, and as he was resurrected, the, the old you is buried and dead and gone, right? And the new creation that you've become is in Christ, and you're alive in Christ. And when you have that grace, it doesn't change that your mind still has a memory. And just because your flesh has been crucified doesn't mean that as long as you're still in it, you're not going to have the things of the flesh drawing you. So... This really sparked up some things because, like, I think we all have memories of things we're not proud of in our past, maybe even of our recent. But, you know, the Lord is quick to forgive, sometimes much quicker than we are. And forgiving ourselves, I think, is an important aspect of letting things go. Uh, no matter when you were converted, I'd rather it's, you know, you've been saved for a long time or a short time, or rather you've been using it wisely for that short or long time. You know, everybody's on a different part of the walk in walking out their faith and, you know, working out their salvation with fear and trembling. And I think all of us have feared at some times more than others. Maybe when we should have feared and trembled a little more in the face of God, we didn't enough. And other times maybe we were too afraid in the face of God, and we weren't being bold and acting in faith enough. So there's such, there's such a wide spectrum of where a believer can be on their walk of belief as they um, are working out their faith. It's, I think that's where we try to just relate as best we can to all situations and all people 
and in that we can offer more love and compassion and hopefully be able to be able to sympathize and empathize with folks you know sometimes like i've never been there i've never done that i could never have that experience or understanding i can only sympathize to a degree i could have no empathy for that situation there's other times where I could put myself in that position and I could somewhat understand if I imagine what it would be like. But then there's the true empathy where, hey, I've had that happen to me before too. I know what it's like to, from my experience and in that I can share in that pain. Or, you know, for all of us, I think we're really going to get into almost all of these things when we go over Romans. And now that we've finished the readout of, I think we broke it into two, We'll go over chapter by chapter here soon, and that'll be really good because there's a lot to know and understand in there that will be so helpful for everybody. But I would just say the more you hunger for him, the more you're going to seek him, the more you're going to receive of him, and the knowledge will grow. If you use it properly, it'll turn to wisdom, and it, it will become more and more profound. So no matter where you, oh dear believer, are at in your walk, just be encouraged to know that it's never as bad as it feels. You know, things aren't really as negative as they seem. And if you have the confident and patient faith, and you can be comforted in standing patiently waiting on the Lord. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but there's something to be said for absolute and complete trust. You know, and with God, that trust can never be broken, at least not from His end. So... I would like to reiterate his point, Mr. Spurgeon, in that the earlier we are satisfied by God through his mercy, these, the earlier we can get started being about his business. And as we are doing our Father's business, it is something to rejoice over. His will be done, you know, in or on earth as it is in heaven. His will be done. That's what we want, you know, because he knows best he's he he knows perfectly i would trust that way better than i would trust anything i could hope for you know of my own volition it's never too late to love christ and it's never too early either so now not every day of loving jesus christ is going to be happy happy joy joy but in the things that we have to hope for and the promises that we are assured of and, I mean, even in the darkest of dark times, there's still something to be happy about if we can still uh, quiet our souls enough to hear that still small voice, you know. So I would just say you get out of your college experience with Christ what you put into it, you know. It's not much different, except for the grades are distributed a little differently. <laughs> So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I could go on and on about this, but I probably shouldn't. So, uh, let's carry on. It's just super cool. And I almost didn't do this today, this one. This was the last one I added to the list, and I moved it first. Not to make the last first and the first last, but considering that that's how it turned out, that it matched up with the verse of the day for the Psalm 90, just trips me out. <laughs> I love you, Jesus. Now, I wanted to go from there uh, to this one from yesterday. It's the morning devotional from Job chapter 40, verse 4. And this is from Mr. Spurgeon's morning and evening devotionals. We're only going to do the morning of yesterday. So, it says, Behold, I am vile. Sounds like a pretty humble statement. Now, one cheering word, poor lost sinner, for thee. You think you must not come to God because you are vile. Now, there is not a saint living on earth, but has been made to feel that he is vile. If Job and Isaiah and Paul were all obliged to say, I am vile, O poor sinner, will you be ashamed to join in the same confession? If divine grace does not eradicate all sin from the believer, how do you hope to do it yourself? 
And if God loves his people while they are yet vile, do you think your vileness will prevent his loving you? <laughs> Believe on Jesus, you outcast of the world's society. Jesus calls you, and such as you are. Not the righteous, not the righteous, sinners Jesus came to call. Even now say, you have died for sinners, I am a sinner. Lord Jesus, sprinkle your blood on me. If you will confess your sin, you shall find pardon. If now with all your heart you will say, I am vile, wash me, you shall be washed now. If the Holy Spirit shall enable you from your heart to cry, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Thou shalt rise from reading this morning's portion with all your sins pardoned. And though thou did wake this morning with every sin that man has ever committed on your head, you shall rest tonight accepted in the Beloved. Though once degraded with the rags of sin, you shall be adorned with the robe of righteousness, and appear white as the angels are. For now, mark it, now is the accepted time. If you believe on him who justifies the ungodly, you are saved. Oh, may the Holy Spirit give you saving faith in him who receives the vilest. Oh, mercy me. <laughs> There's so much to unpackage here. I just want to say, from Romans, we're not sinners anymore once Christ does clothe us in that righteousness. This is almost a call to salvation that Mr. Spurgeon is giving, but it's also a reminder to the fellow believer of being washed in that blood once and for all. The finished work of Christ on the cross and the belief in that and calling on Him is what saves us. It takes the humility to be able to admit and offer up. Um, to hear the call of Christ, you have to humble yourself to even be able to have the ear to hear. The work of the Holy Spirit is what does the, the wooing, you know, and it's the calling. It's just amazing to me to think about it. Uh, there's a lot of people that are full of themselves, and it makes me so sad because our most righteous deeds that we could ever do in these bodies of skin are nothing but dirty rags to God. It's only Christ's righteousness that even tells us what righteousness even is. So it's um, that's one of the themes of Romans is righteousness, and it's all imputed through Christ because it's all His. If there's anything righteous of yourself... It's not his. It's self-righteousness. So now is the accepted time that if you believed literally what he said in your heart, then you have received. N nothing can separate you from that love once you've received it. And nothing can pluck out of his hand what the Father has put in it. So as we remember our sins, you know, it's, it's one of those, God doesn't remember our sins anymore. Once they're forgiven, they're removed completely. But without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement. It took the Lamb of God and His shed blood to give us all authority. But more than anything, before the authority can even come, it's to wash away the curse. Right? And the sin of the world is was on every single person's head until Jesus removed it so he could put the crown of glory on it. Think about that. Now, while the world was dead in sin, God loved it so much he still sent his only begotten son that through the world it might be, or that through Jesus the world might be saved. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that through him it might be saved. So you think about it, when Jesus came to call the lost, you know, a doctor, someone who's in perfect health isn't in need of a doctor. That's what he was saying, right? He didn't come to talk to the healthy people. He came to get the sick people healed, spiritually speaking. You know, when you're dead in sin, uh, that's a pretty terminal outlook right there. 
I mean, I'm talking like eternally terminal. So, you know, to get them awake and in Christ and get them alive in Christ, that's that's all of our number one goals. But I guess two things before we move on. One is that I saw something cool. It's like when you plant the seed is not the time when you reap the harvest. One plants and other waters, God brings increase. So we don't save anybody, we cast the nets. We don't save anybody, we share the gospel. We don't save anybody, we tell people how to come to salvation. Right? We're just ambassadors and we're the we're the vessels of his truth, right? And we we disseminate as we've been blessed and has been revealed to us. It's always just a process of lovingly paying it forward. So I know nothing of my own, only what he's chosen to reveal to me. And at the times when it's proper, I like, that's my only purpose in life, I feel, is to share these things. I just, it, it, it's a sorrowful process to know how little opportunity you ever get out there. <laughs> and that's where the patience comes in. You got to be patient in God. Because there's a lot of people that don't have this understanding yet. There's a lot of people that don't realize that they are vile. You know, I'm a good person. I do good things. I try not to think bad thoughts, you know? I try not to. I, everyone thinks they're a good person until they really are weighed in the balance of what is perfect. You know, a good person is not good enough when you compare it to perfection. There's no amount of goodness that could ever be good enough that would ever equate to perfect. It's just an amazing thing that none are righteous, no, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. Sadly, even once we were in the good shepherd's fold, some of us still even went astray again. But he'll leave the 99 alone to go get the one and bring them back. And I'm ever thankful that I was that one that he was willing to go get. And I'm thankful to the 99 that they were capable of hanging it, hanging it out together amongst themselves while Jesus went to come get me. That's where we're all strengthened in the fellowship that we have in Christ and in the body. And it's, I can't see you listening right now. And I don't know what you're doing on the other end of this screen. But I'll just tell you that I love you. And that you being here makes this a better place. And that if no one's told you today, you matter. And Jesus loves you. And we all need you. You. And if you can't see me, which you can't, I'm pointing my finger <laughs> at you. We all were vile, right? And if left to our own devices, even even then, we're a new creation, but if we do not mortify the deeds of the flesh, if we don't um, get rid of the occasions, and, I mean, the desires might not ever go away, and that's where we ask God to take those desires away, or we ask for Him to replace them with a better desire, something more directed towards Him, you know, I don't know. I have so much to say about this, but, you know, when we were lost and dead in sin, to know that the perfect perfection was willing to humbly sacrifice, Jesus gave himself just so that we wouldn't have to be held accountable for what Perfection requires through righteous judgment. And it's a, it's an ever humbling thing to just remember that we have been vile, that we were sinners. You know, they always say love the love the sinner but hate the sin. And that's so true, right? But a lot of times I think we identify with what what it was that we were caught in sin doing, you know. Let's let's just use a simple example, but like I have lied. Well, if I have lied, that makes me a liar, you know. Um, and when Jesus forgives you of all lies, past, present, and future, for all, all people ever having ever been born, like every lie that's ever been told, Jesus heard it, Jesus knew it was a lie, and Jesus forgave it anyways. You think about that. That's just one type of sin, bearing false witness. Now... Just that one thing alone to be a liar, you know, we know who the father of lies is and to be in his camp, you know, I have lied, the father of lies, now I'm a liar, 
since I have lied, like I can never erase the lie. Once you say a word, it's out there. Right? I mean, imagine God, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And then he said, wait, never mind. <laughs> let me take that back for just a second. Uh, I think I've got a bigger plan than just... It doesn't work that way. And once you put it out there, it's, it's gone. And the damage is done. Or the life is breathed in. It just depends on where your tongue is angling, you know. But... How precious it is to be having that amazing grace, you know. I, I don't know how much more I could ring the bell on the points here, but it's never our righteousness. And as long as we remember that, that we were sinners, right? And that's why I think our heart, if we really hate evil, I think that's a lot of times why we tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to sin and sinners, There was a second thing I was going to say, but I don't want to get off track too much. I mean, I don't mind tangential Timmy. It's been a while, but I just don't want to lose the this, this spirit of what's going on here. Okay. So yeah, we've all been vile and we've all been sinners. And as long as we hold on to the humility of acknowledging that... Um, Know that you're covered in His righteousness now. And know that you've already been forgiven. And we forgive, but we don't forget. That's what I would say. You know, Don't forget where you came from and how you got here. Or else you might be doomed to repeat a few of those cycles. And if it's anything like my cycles, I'd rather just bypass ever thinking about most of them again. Other than in hindsight. So here's a devotional from Mr. Spurgeon also from the New Park Street Chapel. It's also a 365-day sermon, and this was also for Friday, June 7th. And it's going to dovetail right into the last devotional before we go, but... Um, okay. I was hoping it would have the date, like, back in the old days when he originally came up with this one, but I don't see it, so... No worries. So keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Now, one thing I will uh, say before we move forward is that in Romans, the one thing, well, it, it says a lot to say, not just one thing, but I think the primary thing that I really get out of what Romans says overall is that if you're a born-again believer, the sin that is operating in your life is not operating through you spiritually in the sense of what it's you sinning against the I don't need if I put it in my own words it doesn't sound right you know and I don't want to go quote 100% scriptures for everything but it's the sin that happens in your because I know a couple people that doubt their salvation almost every other day because they have some habitual things that they do that are sinful and the fear of God is so much so, but yet their intellect is so much so that there is never any peace, ever. And I, I don't want to go into much more detail because it's a very private thing for that person. But sin is not operating. If the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. As long as we're in the flesh, until the day we die, we're going to have the temptations and desires of the flesh. Now... We are not having any temptations that Jesus was not tempted by or with, and there's no temptation that is unique to any individual. So these are all common issues that as long as you're in a body of flesh, it will be an issue until you're out of this flesh. Now, that doesn't mean you give a legal place for sin to have any sovereignty in your life. If you've been washed clean, then that's where at the point you cannot blemish Christ's righteousness his perfection you cannot make imperfect right so as you put on the incorruptible you have to die to what is corruptible so when you die daily to the flesh doesn't mean that since it died yesterday it's not going to be alive again today it's a daily battle it's a ever-going struggle so sin 
just because you have done a sin, you've been forgiven forever. So you are not your sin. So if you have li if you lied today, you are not a liar. You are forgiven in Christ. But that doesn't mean you can go online. Or else there's no repentance. And if there's no repentance, then this isn't a works-based issue what I'm talking about. This is like being real with yourself issue. This is not just giving yourself the free pass because it's a finished work on the cross that Christ already did. This is one of those, like, how do you be accountable to God? You know, yeah, we're all not perfect, but are you even trying? <laughs> do you even try, bro or sis? You know, like, so I just wanted to say, Paul says, when I sin, it's not sin in me that is operating, or it's not me in sin operating, it's the sin in my, in my flesh. So you could say that the sin uses the flesh as a base, right? And then from that base, it can further penetrate the defenses, if that's what, if that's how you want to put it, right? So I wanted to encourage you guys not to condemn yourself because of sin, because you are there is no condemnation in Christ, and you are in Christ, and if you're alive in Him and clothed in His righteousness doesn't mean that you're not going to make mistakes along the way, right? Because Christ is perfect, you're not, I'm not. We're working on it, though, right? So, let me get myself out of the way. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. This prayer was the prayer of a saint, the prayer of a holy man of God. Did David need to pray thus? Did the man after God's own heart need to cry? keep back your servant he's saying hold me back hold your servant back also from presumptuous sins is how we would say it in the modern day lingo okay so yes he did that's the answer david a man after god's very own heart did need to pray keep back your servant and note the beauty of the prayer and so once again, here's another prayer, right? Just straight from Scripture. So I thought that was uh, really cool. Note the beauty of the prayer. If I might translate it into more metaphorical style, Mr. Spurgeon is going to do that. It's like this. Curb your servant from presumptuous sins. I just gave us a metaphorical update since this is 100 years old, right? <laughs> So curb your servant from presumptuous sins. Keep him back or he will wander to the edge of the precipice of sin. Now precipice is like the very tip top point of no return. Once you pass that point, like you're all, you're you get done gone over the edge, man. <laughs> so keep back your servant or he will wander to the edge of the precipice of sin. Hold him in, Lord, he is apt to run away. Curb him, put the bridle on him. Do not let him do it. Let your overpowering grace keep him holy. If that, and now it's not just a him, masculine pronoun, but hold us in, Lord. Like hold us inside of yourself. Oh, we're apt to do the wrong thing or to make the wrong choice. God, keep us. Hold us back from the wrong and keep us in your goodness. You know? Put a bridle in my mouth so you can steer my very direction and my essence. Do not let us do what it is that our spirit is willing to do. Uh, let us do what our spirit is willing to do and do not let us do what it is that our flesh desires. Let your overpowering grace keep us in your holiness, Lord. When he would do evil, then do you draw him to good. And when his evil pro propensity... when. <laughs> Let your overpowering grace keep him holy. When he would do evil, then do you draw him to good. And when his evil propensities would lead him astray, then do you check him. Keep back your servant pro from presumptuous sins. What then? Is it true that the best of men may sin presumptuously? That's the key word there. Ah, it is true. It is a solemn thing to find the Apostle Paul warning saints against the most loathsome of sins. He says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, 
fornication, uncleanness, idolatry, inordinate affection, and such like. What? Do saints want warning against such sins as these? Yes, they do. The highest saints may sin the lowest sins, unless kept by divine grace. You old, experienced Christians. Uh, we went to the young, young bucks first, now we're all the old, experienced ones, right? Boast not in your experience. Don't brag about your experience, because you may yet trip up unless you cry, Hold you me up, or God you hold me up, and I shall be safe. You whose love is fervent, whose faith is constant, whose hopes are bright, say not, I shall never sin. I've done that before. Oh, I'll never, I'd never do that, you know. Oh, I'm never going to sin that sin again. Don't ever say that. That's presumptuous of you to boast that you will never, unless you can follow through on your word. It's better to, and not that this is making a vow, but it's pretty close, and the scriptures are very clear. It's better to not make a vow than to make one and break one. So instead of saying, I'll never do that again, or I'll never sin, rather, or instead, cry out, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Now, God never tempts, so he won't lead you into the temptation, but he'll be there with you through it. And when we are in temptation, God, do not leave us there, for unless you hold us fast, I feel I must, I shall decline and prove an apostate after all. Let me read it without butchering it with my own. Lord, lead me not into temptation, and when there, leave me not there. For unless thou hold me fast, I feel I must, I shall decline, and prove an apostate after all. Interesting, strong talk. And it says things to meditate on if you want to go to the scriptures and find the backing. It says five ways to lay hold of the power of God against temptation. So how to guard against temptation. Uh, it says to pray. And Luke 22.40 is the example of that. Obey. Psalm 17.5 is the example for that. Watch. 1 Corinthians 16.13. Exhort. Hebrews 3.13. And read. Psalm 119.11. Ah, so this was from 1857. It is right there. So yeah, if you want to if you want to have help with temptation, uh, laying hold on the power of God, pray, obey, watch, exhort, and read. And if it's reading, it's talking about reading the scriptures. So God, please keep us all from presumptuous sins. Uh, I want to type this in. I just want to do a quick definition real fast. I usually like to go to Merriam-Webster as it's pretty neutral. Overstepping due bounds as of pro pro propriety or courtesy. Taking liberties. Mm, not very comprehensive. <laughs> yeah, presumptuous is, to me, it's pretty close to assuming. To presume is almost like assume. Pre is before. And if you think like consume. Uh, I, in my mind when I think of the word presum presumptuous or to presume is like you're taking a guess at it. But in a confident, overconfident kind of way. To be presumptuous is to draw a conclusion that you don't have enough information to have drawn that conclusion based on the information itself. So you have to fill in. A little, you have to read between the lines. So someone who's very presumptuous would make uh, a bold statement or claim that really doesn't have the, the information or evidence to back it up. So when you sin, a presumptuous sin to me would be, oh, with the way that he was wording it, it's like it's so simple of a thing that you don't even acknowledge it as sin, or it's so small of a sin that, of course, I could never do that one. Or on the other end of the spectrum, like murder. Now, I would never murder anybody. But when push comes to shove, you know, I think 
um, I think uh, people are capable of doing things that they would never imagine that they could do, you know, and I've been in prison with quite a few people that after knowing the content of their character, I could not understand how they could have done what they did. But, you know, I wasn't judging them. I've had my lapses of judgment in my life, and who am I to judge somebody for theirs, you know? That's how I look at it. But to to be presumptuous about things is like, to me, it's it's not coming from a place of meekness or humility. So that's it. That's the key word for that that whole thing. And I thought it was more helpful to understand based on having a definition of the keyword, but you let me down, Mr. Webster, Mr. Merriam. <laughs> now, this is really, I think, like summarizing what we've all just gone through from the beginning to the end, and today's, um, today's devotionals are awesome. So from Psalm chapter 97, verse 10 says, You that love the Lord hate evil. Now, there's a scripture, and it says, that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Hating evil is fearing the Lord. If you cross-reference this scripture with that one. Uh, you that love the Lord hate evil. <laughs> That's really cool to consider. So you have a good reason to hate evil. For only consider what harm it has already wrought to you. Take a moment, please. Just take a moment to reflect in your life what evil things have had an impact or an effect in your life. I mean, not just evil you've done or thought about doing, or not even just evil that's been done to you, but evil that you have known about. So, you have a good reason to hate evil. All you have to do is consider what harm it has already wrought you. Oh, what a world of mischief sin has brought into your heart. Sin blinded you so that you could not see the beauty of the Savior. It made you deaf so that you could not hear the Redeemer's tender invitations. Sin turned your feet into the way of death and poured poison into the very fountain of your being. It tainted your heart and made it, quote, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, end quote. Now, that's scripture. Anyone that says, oh, they've got a good heart. I always think about this. Not to say that they're... How can you, how can you argue? Deceit, the heart is what it says is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now, I don't think that's the original condition of the heart. It was tainted, as, as Mr. Spurgeon says here. As the scriptures indicate, too. Oh, what a creature you was when you... Oh, what a creature thou wast when evil had done its utmost with thee before divine grace interposed. So you either have the nature of sin or you have the divine grace. One or the other. Can't have both. Thou wast an heir of wrath, even as others. Thou didst run with the multitude... To do evil. Such were all of us. But Paul reminds us, you are washed. You, oh, it's, I need to read the buts. But you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the Spirit of our God. We have good reason indeed for hating evil when we look back and trace its deadly workings. Such mischief did evil do us that our souls would have been lost had not omnipotent love interfered to redeem us. If it hadn't been for all-knowing love that interfered with our souls going to be lost forever, that interference was only to redeem us. That's amazing grace right there. Even now it is an active enemy ever watching to do us hurt and to drag us to perdition. Therefore, hate evil, O Christians, unless you desire trouble. If you would straw your path with thorns and plant nettles in your death pillow, then neglect to hate evil. But if you would live a happy life and die a peaceful death, then walk in all the ways of holiness 
hating evil even unto the end. If you truly love your Savior and would honor him, then hate evil. We know of no cure for the love of evil in a Christian like abundant intercourse with the Lord Jesus. Dwell much with him, and it is impossible for you to be at peace with sin. Ain't that the truth, man? Dwell much with Christ, and it is impossible for you to be at peace with sin. Order my footsteps by your word, and make my heart... Let me read it in there, lingo. Order my footsteps by thy word, and make my heart sincere. Let sin have no dominion, Lord, but keep my conscience clear. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I don't think I need to add anything to any of that. I mean, other than to fe the f the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Um. <laughs> okay, sorry, I can't see my keyboard. And we're almost done, guys. I just want to see Proverbs eight thirteen is what it is. The fear of the Lord. is is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. So the fear of the Lord, now the word is wasn't originally in the translation, but the fear of the Lord to hate evil. It's This is just to give us English speakers some context. So the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, right? And these are where evil stems from, pride, arrogancy, the evil way. And froward mouth, that's a lying mouth. All those things God hates. So, understanding that fearing the Lord and hating evil, loving God and hating evil, loving God and fearing Him, it's all the same thing. You can interchange them all. Now, this is really cool. This is my favorite uh, mic dropper here. Let me do one last word definition. Uh, zeal. I want to look up the definition of zeal, and we'll bypass old Mr. Merriam-Webster this time. Uh, let's see, Oxford English is good. Okay, so the definition of zeal is great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. Okay, well, our objective is the gospel message. That's also our cause, is Christ, but it's our pursuit to get closer to Christ, to have a better relationship with Him, a great energy in being Spirit-filled, enthusiastic to share that Spirit and fellowship in that Spirit, and to just disseminate truth and love. So, to have zeal, it's more than just passion or um, interest. It's a biblical principle of how we are to approach God, you know. Now, I've mentioned before to be overzealous is can be a bad thing. Um, just like being overconfident can be a bad thing. Confidence isn't bad in and of itself. Neither is zealousness or to have zeal. Now, just for it, I didn't do this earlier, but... He does make a reference in this um, last passage we're going to read... He does make a reference to one of the things that I have always referred to as one of our spiritual um, warfare in Ephesians. It talks about the armor, the spiritual armor. And in the Old Testament, it mentions the cloak or a cloak to wear zealousness like a cloak. And so I've always referred to, you know, like the breastplate of righteousness. There, nothing covers your backside. That's one thing I've always pointed out. Is there's nothing to defend your backside in the in the Ephesians spiritual armor analogy. And in the Old Testament, it does mention a cloak of zeal. Now, a cloak isn't going to stop a sword from going in your back, but it depends. I mean, God's zealousness or your zeal for God might actually do a lot more for your back than a breastplate could do for the front. I don't know. Like in modern lingo talking... This is as, uh, oh wow, this is super cool. The full scripture says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. 
So because God has uh, either chastened or rebuked you, know that he has loved you, and that's the only reason you've received a rebuke or a chastening from the Lord. And that should give you a reason to be zealous, obviously, but repent. You repent on the rebuke or the chastening, and then you will be zealous because now that you've gotten the negative out of the way, there's nothing but positive left. So, Mr. Spurgeon says, be zealous. That's what he takes from that full passage. And if you would see souls converted, if you would hear the cry that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord, if you would place crowns upon the head of the Savior, and his thorn lifted high, wait, <laughs> I was thinking of his thorny crown, his throne lifted high. So if you would place crowns upon the head of the Savior and his throne lifted high, then be filled with zeal. For under God, the way of the world's conversion must be by the zeal of the church. Every grace shall do exploits, but this shall be first, prudence, knowledge, patience, and courage will follow in their places, but zeal must lead the van caravan, right? It is not the extent of your knowledge, though that is useful. It's not the extent of your talent, though that is not to be despised. It is your zeal that shall do great exploits. This zeal is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Remember that hunger we prayed for at the beginning of this video? That's asking for zeal. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. It draws its vital force from the continued operations of the Holy Ghost in the soul. If our inner life dwindles, if our heart beats slowly before God, we shall not know zeal. But if all be strong and vigorous within, then we cannot but feel a loving anxiety to see the kingdom of Christ come, and His will done on earth even as it is in heaven. A deep sense of gratitude will nourish Christian zeal. Uh, there's a scripture that says, What little you have will be taken away if you don't appreciate it. And to those that have, if they appreciate it, they will have more. A deep sense of gratitude will nourish Christian zeal. Looking to the hole of the pit whence we were digged, we find abundant reason why we should spend and be spent for God. And zeal is also stimulated by the thought of the eternal future. It looks with tearful eyes down to the flames of hell, and it cannot slumber. It looks up with anxious gaze to the glories of heaven, and it cannot but bestir itself. It feels that time is short compared with the work to be done. Oh, man. <laughs> a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but a workman that knows time is short. If the enemy knows that time is short, how much more should we understand and feel that? It feels that time is short compared with the work to be done, and therefore it devotes all that it has to the cause of its Lord. And it is ever strengthened by the remembrance of Christ's example. He was clothed with zeal as with a cloak. How swift the chariot wheels of duty went with him. He knew no loitering by the way. Let us prove that we are his disciples by manifesting the same spirit of zeal. Amen. <laughs> so cool. I don't even know. What, there's so many things to say. It's like a train wreck in my brain and in my spirit to want to share. But I, I remembered the other thing from earlier. Maybe it's better for timing and placement to have it now. When, when you, we all have that feeling, I think, and maybe it's presumptuous of me to say this, but I feel like we all know there's a lot of work to do for the kingdom, and we all know that time is short, and if we just, we don't walk by sight, but if you open your eyes and look with the sight that you have, You'll see that the world has got a lot of things going on in it, and a lot of those things are not helpful for our spiritual edification. 
Okay, that's the most euphemistic way I could think to put it. Now, if you look to the world with those eyes, it'll bring nothing but controversy, uh, contention, animosity. I could I could name a million feelings that the world could give you, or a million thoughts the world could give you. Um, but that's why we don't look to the world for our things. It doesn't mean you put your head in the sand and don't you know keep your eyes open, your ears open, but just know that you're not going to be spiritually fed through the news media, even alternative news media. You're not going to be fed through social media. I mean, not in and of itself. <laughs> you're going to you're gonna be fed and watered wherever you go to be fed and watered, and you're going to get whatever water and food there is there. And some of these things are spiritual. I shouldn't say you won't get spiritually fed on social media. You just not might not be getting the bread of life. I'll put it that way, you know. But then again... Aren't we on social media right now? Aren't we all getting fed bread of life right now? So, I don't know. I think it's, for me, I feel the heavy presence of you lead the horse to water, can't make the horse drink. I even usually take the analogy a step further and say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it eat. <laughs> you know, you can go for a long time without eating but you'll die pretty quick without drinking but if you're thirsty to death you're gonna drink right away but once you drink you still might take a long time before you decide to eat and i think to myself there's a lot of people that um i just wish they'd try harder or they i wish they'd put more effort into their relationship with god and maybe that's a presumptuous thing to think and feel about other people because I know myself, uh, there's been times where I wasn't as zealous, or there was times when I had a lot of zeal, but I was looking into the wrong places and getting super excited about things that eventually turned out to be dung heaps. <laughs> Literal, you know, dung heaps. And now I look back, I'm like, man, how long did I waste over in that dung heap right there? And then I went right on to this dung heap right there. I know a lot of people that are like living in a dung heap thinking that it's like the true divine message of God. And it's it's scary to know where we, how soon we are bewitched sometimes, as Paul said to the Galatians. You know, like one minute we're all walking the walk together. Next minute, you know, somebody's done gone off over that precipice. Somebody has gone into complete false or wrong uh, teachings. And to me, it's almost more dangerous than to backslide in rebellion like a prodigal son. At least when he was at the at the pig trough, he knew it was he knew it was the garbage. It was easier for him to come to his senses because he knew he was doing wrong from the very beginning, from the beginning to the middle to the end, wrong, wrong, wrong. But when someone starts out in the right direction on a straight and narrow path, all it takes is one step off of a straight and narrow path. You're no longer on the narrow. You just went a little wide, you know, one step to the wide and you might be doing the splits, you know, I don't know how it works in your life, but I've, man, I John Claude Van Damme did a few times and it didn't feel good because I didn't stretch first. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, we all fall, we all trip or stumble, we all get off track, you know, and I don't have a problem with that, but it's when people get full of conceit or when they have the presumption of truth. You know, they're not having an absolute truth. They're having a presumption. And that presumption right there is the pride that's in the way. And it's more than just a stumbling block if they don't stumble over it. Uh, I think I said it before, but a lot of um, idols are built one stumbling block at a time. So we have to be really careful because what goes up in pride will come down, you know. And a lot of people have their high tower and fortress that they go run and hide in. It's a lot of times their wisdom, their knowledge, their truth, their pride, their understanding, their interpretations. What a dangerous place it is to think that you have the truth, to believe that you have the truth, and to be so wrong. That's going to be the worst thing to ever hear is someone that thinks they know Christ. And when they get to actually see him face to face, and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Sorry. Sorry, not sorry. You know, for me, my heart's already broken. If one person goes down that path, and it wouldn't be 
in the word of God if more than one wasn't going down that path. And it breaks my heart. But all we can do is all that we're called to do. And it's through the zealousness that we show. And it's our passion. It's our compassion. It's the grace that we afford others when they don't deserve it. It's the forgiveness that we exercise. It's the mercy. Um, it's the words we choose to use. You know, it's the actions that other people notice without ever saying anything. It's being in the presence. Being in the presence, then the presence is in you. And people will see the presence of God in you and think that it's you. And when they look to you and they point their finger at you or they start to say something about you, don't ever point that finger back at yourself and you're like, yeah, that's right. Point that finger up to where all those good things originated from. Glory be to God forever and ever, because that's the only thing worth glorifying. You know, <laughs> maybe I'm getting self-righteous now, but I just, I'm hungry, man. I'm hungry, and I, I want to eat. <laughs> I want to eat. Who's eating with me? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Holy, holy, holy. Holy is your name, holy is your son, holy is your spirit, God, and we just thank you for your righteousness. We thank you for your absolute truth. We thank you for the law that you gave us so that we could know how we are imperfect. We thank you for revealing to us the power of sin and death, which is in that law, which only reveals how imperfect we all are as individuals. But God, I just praise your holy name for making the Lamb of God perfect. And even though you made Adam perfect in your very own image, disobedience wrought sin. But through one man's sin and one man's disobedience, many have perished. But through one man's obedience, Sin and death have been conquered forever. We worship that Lamb of glory, Lord, and we thank you for that capitulation. We thank you for that substitution. We thank you for the cleansing of that blood. But we have the hope in the resurrection that we are alive in Christ this very moment. This moment in our time, but forever in your eternity, Lord. We just humble ourselves to that truth and to the power of your might. And we exercise our faith. And we just praise Jesus' holy and precious name. I just pray a double portion of your spirit to pour out and anoint all those that truly believe. Give us the zeal and hunger that we need in this day and age. The famine's coming and it's already here, Lord, for your word, not food and drink. There's people that are going... There's people that are losing their souls and they've got the key to salvation two and three at a time sometimes. But yet, you can't use the key if you don't use it. Help us, help us to be better examples of how to show others the way to salvation. Help us be better ambassadors to point the way to Christ. Help us embody your truth in a way that is Revealing and manifesting of your power is it's your spirit, Lord. Help us sow your seed, and we just pray for your watering in this latter rain to bring the increase that you see fit for your kingdom. Thank you for making us fit vessels of mercy, and Lord, we just pray that we can help in your plan the best of our ability, Lord, and where we fall short, magnify your glory and power in our weaknesses. But help us to come to fruition to what it is that if we could just turn one vessel of wrath into a vessel of your mercy, you are a merciful God, and as much as we all want righteous judgment for all the evil that is under the sun this day today, your mercy is greater than your wrath, and we love you for both because you are a just God and it pleases you to serve justice. But in due time, we trust your perfect timing, Lord. And even though suffering must go on for a short time, 
we thank you for that time of your grace because that's more opportunity for those that are lost and dead in sin to come to the salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ, alone. We just pray that that salvation goes out into the world, into all nations, kindreds, and tongues this very moment by the power of this prayer. We call your holy angels to come and move, and we ask your Spirit to move, and we ask your Son to just be. Amen. And amen.